Well, um, my name is Henry Martin, and I am um, I'm a um, I'm a regular guy, just uh, out trying to make ends meet like everybody else. I have um, I uh, graduated from high school in 1988, Jefferson City High. Uh, at that point, I went on to uh, join the U.S. Army. Uh, where I spent the next uh, four years, and uh, during that time I was uh, stationed in Germany in Frankfurt uh, as part of 3rd Armor Division. I uh, got to see the Berlin Wall come down, um, and then I was deployed to Desert Storm, uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Um, the uh, I went from went from there, came back to the States, and decided I was going to get, uh, get out of the Army and uh, get my... Uh, degree. I got a degree in teaching. Um, I've taught mathematics or been a uh, building administrator for the past 19 years. Um, uh, in that time, I've also been a football and wrestling coach. Um, currently, I'm a, a Missouri State High School Activities Association game official. Um, that was the one thing uh, throughout the campaign uh, as the fall kicked off that uh, we had to keep sacred. Friday nights were sacred because uh I had to explain to the uh, uh, campaign team that uh, if you try and host a a campaign event on a Friday night, you're going to indicate that you have absolutely no business trying to represent the people in this district. That that might be a pretty (laughs) fair statement, actually, to make. Okay, so you you mentioned your experience, a breadth of experience, but you talked about your military experience. Um, Mm -hmm. How did that shape you? Well... It, it wasn't until you're you're sitting there and you you got um, you're in Germany when the Berlin Wall falls and you see the sense of relief on German German nationals they're being reunited with their families and and brothers that have been cut off from them uh, since the 1950s. Seeing the aftermath of war makes you think twice about when the United States starts with cavalier attitudes about deployment of soldiers and going to war and things like that. Those those are big deal things to me. The unintended consequence of war is there are casualties, and those, sometimes those casualties aren't combatants. They're uh, innocent civilians that don't deserve it. Right. So that's your war experience. That's how that's shaped you. Now, when you look at this district, um, Missouri's 6th district, um, it's it's a quite interesting district because it, it has bits of Kansas City, it has bits of St. Joseph, and then it has a lot of, of rural area. Mm-hmm. So I want to focus on that rural area for now. What mm-hmm. what will you do for Missouri agriculture? Well, the first thing that needs to happen is we need to be serious about uh, getting, getting things like the Farm Bill passed in a timely fashion. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that it got hung up uh, at the at the end and it was ready to pass... Uh, but the problem is that the the House decided they wanted to keep a work requirement uh, that was unnecessary that the Senate the Senate wouldn't approve. It wouldn't have defunded SNAP program, but it was an additional work requirement. There's already a work requirement contained within the SNAP program, and they wanted to add another one. Had the House just pulled that, the Farm Bill would have passed and it was done. In essence, you're doing that. You're playing politics with people's lives. And you're playing politics with the lives of our farmers. You're playing politics with the lives of people who are in need. At the end of the day, we, we've got to stop looking at those who have not as just takers. They are not the enemy. They're Americans in need. And I think what we need to ask is, why do these Americans need something? Why do they need this additional help? So I, I do say we're, we're making uh, victims of the system villains. And that's not fair. The biggest thing that we need to do for uh, agriculture is is pay attention to the, the world around us and understand that we are citizens of the world. And as citizens of the world, we have a responsibility to participate in the world. That includes a world market. When our president issued the tariffs that he issued, um, we, we held a uh, farmer's forum a few weeks ago, and uh, basically I asked what that meant. And uh, one of the farmers said it, it means about three dollars a bushel. Hmm. And I said, three dollars a bushel. I said, OK, so let me put it into math terms because I understand the numbers. I said, so how many bushels do you get per acre? He said at the low end, about forty five. So I said, so one hundred thirty five dollars an acre that you're losing. So if you're running a thousand acres of beans, you're losing one hundred thirty five thousand dollars in a year. He said, yeah, he said, and it sounds like a lot of money. He said, but when you add in 
your your cost for your seed, right. your cost for your uh, combine use, cost for this, cost for that. It does, it's not one hundred thirty five thousand right. dollars. And so we're making foreign policy because of somebody's politics, not because of what's good. And then Sam said nothing. He just said we need to look at the long term payout. Well, what about our farmers in trouble right now? The long term payout is fine. But it needs to be a long term thought out strategy and not something that's knee jerk just because you can do it. So your concern about the current administration policy is that there is no real policy, that it's just, like you said, a knee jerk reaction. Is that a fair assessment? It's a knee jerk reaction to their perceived um issues Mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was any thought that went into what is going to be the backlash here, what's going to happen to the American farmer. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, if if that's how you're going to you're going to govern, then we're going to we're going to continue with problems. Our small towns that serve these that serve our farm communities, they're 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 drying up Mm -hmm. and it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard for them. It's hard for their families. And we just finished in Keatsville uh, today mm-hmm. and ba- well, just before we came here, actually. And basically, they all say the same thing. We're looking for jobs to come back to our towns. Yeah. Our towns are going away and they're going away because not because so much because of automation, but you have <laughs> lots of lots of uh, mergers and acquisitions. Companies get bought up and they're merged and they close segments of the company and so on and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. So unintended consequences of some of uh, policies that have been made at the top. Mm-hmm. So you talk about these unintended consequences from these policies. What policies would you put forward that would improve the situation? Well, first things first, uh, the the tariffs need to be lifted right. immediately to to allow for um, our farmers to actively trade. Mm-hmm. Secondly, um, I as whether whether you like it or not, we are in international we're in international waters with all of this. Mm-hmm. To include, um, you know, pulling us out of TPP, mm-hmm. not such a grand idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, NAFTA has been renegotiated. Uh, that that's been that problem may have been solved, but. During the time that all these things are, are torn up and we're we're not uh, participating, we're losing those markets. Markets that our farmers worked hard to get over years. Mm-hmm. Our farm markets worked hard to get over years. And so now we've got to work our way back into these markets. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not fair to the American farmer because he or she can go out on the world market and get a better price than you know, necessarily that the the nation can no right. negotiate. So you're taking you're you're basically yanking that away from the farmer. And when you yank that away from the farmer, you're yanking that away from that community that is already struggling. So in your view, that's shortchanging the people who put those people in power in, in the first place. OK, that's fair enough. So you, you're going around and you said that You've had farmers say this to you just recently. What other concerns are you hearing on the ground from <laughs> the bi- voters? The biggest one is health care. Yeah. Everyone's terrified. Um, we're, we're one, somebody who's one major illness or injury away from ruin. Um, we have got to seriously look at the, let, let's, we got to set the politics aside. Everybody's got to drop their, drop their battle axe and just say, you know what? Hey, let's listen. Let's talk. Mm-hmm. Okay. We have folks pointing out um, what's bad about single payer systems. Okay, I'm I'm going to concede that that you may have an argument there. They're pointing out what's bad about the Affordable Care Act. Okay, I'm going to concede you may have an argument there. But if I'm going to concede those things, then you probably on the other side, someone needs to concede that maybe there is some good that we can get out of a single payer system. Maybe there is something that we can salvage within the Affordable Care Act in the short term that will that will bridge us through to something better. That's an American plan. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that American that an American family should go broke because of a major illness or injury. Mm-hmm. Um, spoke with one gentleman, um, and this was this was on one of my phone call nights, and uh, he said he said I'm sorry, uh, can't contribute right now. Um, I've been retired three years and I haven't been able to enjoy my retirement because my wife fell ill and it's all we can do to keep up uh, premium payments and take care of uh, all the things that we need uh, to keep keep her alive, Mm -hmm. keep her healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, 
that's not the America I put the uniform on for. Right. Um, I, I put the uniform on for an America that believes in opportunity. Mm-hmm. And we're taking those opportunities away and we're, t- we're turning people who are in need into victims. Mm-hmm. You know, some of these people that, you know, we, we can go round and round and it's, it's like a hamster wheel because we're just we're just running and we're not getting anywhere because we're too busy fighting. And everybody has their their position on how things should be. Well, you know, you can't govern from the extreme right or the extreme left. You govern, true governance happens down the middle. Right. And I'm, I'm glad that you said that. That's a that's a great way to transition to what I want to ask you next. It, it, it's hard to be in the middle these days. I, I heard Senator Jeff Flake last week. He's a Republican from Arizona. He said, if you're a moderate, that ends up in your opponent's ad, not your own. What is your response to that? And how do you think going forward, this, this country, we are, we are very divided. How, how do we bridge that divide? Well, in Missouri on the ballot, we have... Uh Clean, clean Missouri. Mm-hmm. Uh, initiatives like that are a big step forward in trying to end this. Mm-hmm. Because the reason we are so extreme is because the gerrymandering has gotten down to a science. They have it down to a science that they can predict how someone is going to vote based on history. And so what they do is they gerrymander these districts to be safe Republican or safe Democrat. So ba- so over time, what's happened, then you add social media to the mix and you got yourself a pretty volatile mix. So what happens is moderate people like myself that, that will sit in there and say, you know what, you may be right about what you're talking about, but let's look at this side, too. We come under attack or and, and if you're already holding office, somebody to your right mm-hmm. or to your left mm-hmm. is going to run primary. You. They're going to come primary. you. And guess what? Because the districts have been gerrymandered in such a way to guarantee a specific result. We get more extreme candidates. And I think we can look at our political environment and we can see how extreme our candidates have become. I don't have an extreme view one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I want to do what's right by the people of the 6th District of Missouri. Mm -hmm. I want to do what's right by the people of the United States of America. Period. And that should be the goal of every elected official. Every elected official should be prepared to walk into office and say, you know what? Campaign's over. Mm -hmm. I represent 100% of the people that uh, elected me and those that didn't elect me too. I represent them. Um, my opponent um, has an ad that says, a voice for rural Missouri. Well, what about urban Missouri that you also represent? They deserve a voice too. Granted, geography-wise, the district encompasses a great deal. The, the largest land mass is rural, but the largest population is urban. So you have to have a high have to have somebody that understands that, hey, OK, in the urban areas, their per capita cost is going to be less to do thir- certain things than it is going to be in a rural Missouri, a rural area like Keatsville, Missouri. So if I come to Keatsville, um, they want to pass a water project and they want to pass a bond issue. Their bond is going to be either longer or more expensive per capita than a bond issue in, say, Kansas City, for example. So that's where the U.S. congressman comes in, Mm -hmm. says, "Okay, well, what does the county have on it and what does the state have on it? Okay, well, let's make up the difference with this. These federal funds. Mm -hmm. That's my job Mm -hmm. is to come in and help. My job is to also show up to show up and talk to the people in the community and find out what's going on. As I go around and knock doors, it's like, whoa, nobody comes out here and campaigns. People have just come to accept and take it for granted that you're going to vote a certain way just because you're a Democrat or Republican. Uh, I knocked the lady's door and she and I said, uh, "Hi, I'm Henry Martin. I'm running for the U.S. House." And uh, she said, and I gave her my my uh, uh, my literature, and uh, she says, "Well, what party are you with?" I said, "Well, I'm a Democrat." She says, "Well, I'm a Republican." I said, well, that doesn't mean you can't vote for me. And she says, well, no, it doesn't. 
I said, has my opponent knocked your door? She says, come to think of it, I've been report- voting Republican all my life, and no Republicans ever knocks my door. <laughs> and I said, oh, maybe it's time to consider something. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm here, and I'm going to be here. Mm-hmm. We've taken away the accountability of our legislators because of gerrymandering. If you're a person that doesn't really, that, that has already picked your voters, and you don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to get your seat back, why should you campaign? Why should you go and knock that lady's door? Mm -hmm. There's no reason to. Why should you hold a town hall? Mm -hmm. There's no reason to. Why should you go into places where it's uncomfortable when you cast a vote that's bad and the people are pissed off about it? Mm -hmm. Why should you go and be held accountable? There's no reason to be. And that's where we are in our politics. And that's not just here in the 6th District. Mm -hmm. That's across the country. Mm -hmm. Because there's no accountability from our elected officials, that's why we have all this fighting and bickering on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And they eat it up. They eat it up because we're out here fighting with each other. And meanwhile, they're in Washington and $779 billion deficit. And nobody's saying anything about that. But look, the economy's strong. But we have a $779 billion deficit and it's projected to get bigger. Mm -hmm. So... Are we fiscally responsible or are we just OK because the economy is strong? Right. At one time, the Republicans I knew mm-hmm. would step up to the plate and say, oh, wait a minute. This deficit's out of control. But now the deficit doesn't seem to matter. And then on the backside, you want to balance it on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Mm-hmm. And you call, want to call these programs entitlements. These aren't entitlements. These are things that people have worked for their entire lives. That's not a fair assessment, and you're not being honest with the voters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to just wrap up really quickly. On November 6th, when people wake up in the morning, why should they vote for you over Sam Graves? They should vote for me because I'm going to show up. Mm -hmm. I'm the guy that's been out here driving these roads. I I know what the roads look like in every single county. Mm -hmm. We are on the seventh day of an eight-day RV tour across the district. We will have covered 22 counties. Mm -hmm. There are some counties whose roads are in good repair. There are some counties whose roads are in really bad repair. Mm -hmm. And believe me, in an RV, you don't miss a single bump. (laughs) I mean, it's almost like we have a map. Oh, yeah. Did we miss a bump? Oh, no, the bump map had it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it, it's, it's, It's a tragic state of straight state of affairs. People are talking about well, what's going on with the roads in my area. Missouri is trying to trying to address it with a gas tax. Mm-hmm. There's we need real infrastructure spending. Mm-hmm. There's talk of public private partnerships. And, and I know of one uh, media source that actually looks at that um, and says, oh, that's a good idea. Well, here's the thing about public private partnerships that people don't seem to take into consideration. If I'm a large corporation, where's the benefit in me building a road in Keatsville, Missouri? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you get your grain to market, but um, if I might be able to make it a toll road and I'm a corporation, there's not anywhere near the traffic in St. Louis or Kansas City, St. Joseph, uh, Springfield. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere near that traffic. So all those federal dollars that we think will be coming into these small communities— they're they're probably not going to make it there. Now there will be a couple of companies that'll go in. They'll they'll build it, you know. But it'd be kind of like Google that tried to that said they were going to put fiber coast to coast, mm-hmm. and when they looked at the actual cost benefit, they looked at their their early returns and they weren't getting the, the return that they expected mm-hmm. on laying all that fiber. They kind of tabled it for now. Yeah, I think it's what four cities in, in America. Yeah. So that's what we're looking at. We've got to be realistic. The government has a responsibility to us. Their responsibility to the people of the United States of America. There are two things that I believe that our government is responsible for doing, and that's providing opportunity and preserving our freedom. And a vote for me is a vote to, tr- to do those two things with our government. We never lost. We never lost our country. The United States was never lost. What we've lost is our government. 
our government's not working for the people anymore. It's working for the people who are able to buy politicians. I am not a bought politician. There is not the people won't will buy my services Mm -hmm. to serve them. That's who I'm accountable to. Mm -hmm. I'm not accountable to Lockheed Martin. I'm not accountable to Boeing. They'll sink or swim based on their business plan. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be dependent upon my vote in Congress to keep those businesses afloat. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've got going on. There are companies that are hanging in the balance based on the based on a vote of a congressman or senator. Where is our government? Where is the government of by and for the people? Instead of of by and for our corporate masters. That's a little Bernie is sounding and, and I get that. But. That's that's a real assessment of where we are. As a country, Mm -hmm. we need to take our government back, not our country, take our government back to work for the people. Mm 